tonight, a young policewoman, one of two killed in a shocking head-on crash near Mildura. Another senior officer flown to Melbourne in a critical condition. Also, a crowd crash at Albert Park as more than 100,000 fans lap up Formula One fever. Breaking news from Canberra. Scott Morrison to call the election tomorrow morning. More than 50 people killed in a ballistic missile strike at a busy train station in Ukraine. Princess Anne arrives in Australia with a special nod to her late father. And despair for Daisy and the demons in a grand final heartbreaker. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Mike Amor and Rebecca Madden. Good evening. Victoria Police has been rocked by the death of a young officer killed in a shocking head-on crash near Mildura. The 25-year-old was behind the wheel of an unmarked police car alongside her colleague when another driver veered directly into their path. Flags at half-mast and growing floral tributes for senior constable Briar Joyce. A split-second mistake has shattered three families and left Victoria Police grieving one of its own. No one expects to go to work and not come home. I spoke to that member's uh, mother today. I spoke to her this morning. I know that there's nothing that you can actually say that's going to take that pain away. The 25-year-old was driving an unmarked police car during a routine patrol with colleague leading senior constable Thomas Kinane. When the driver of this ute somehow lost control and veered onto the wrong side of Kulkine Way near Mildura, colliding head-on. The force of the impact so strong, senior constable Joyce couldn't be saved. The driver of the ute, a 23-year-old man, also died at the scene. Leading senior constable Kinane was flown to Melbourne with critical injuries. It's a tragedy um, <clears throat> for the families and friends of those police officers. Uh, it's a tragedy and uh, absolutely heartbreaking for the um, family and friends of the civilian driver involved. This is a really tough day for Victoria Police um, and everyone who works there and all the families. April 23 will mark two years since the Eastern Freeway tragedy where four police officers were killed. Senior Constable Joyce, now the 175th officer lost in the line of duty in Victoria. The trauma the uh, trauma that then gets relayed to colleagues investigating colleagues and going to the scene and going and doing what they do. Her colleagues paying tribute online. No words can describe a tragedy like this. Rest easy, you beautiful soul. From Premier Daniel Andrews, when an officer is lost in the line of duty, the entire force and their loved ones feel that loss. Certainly the ripples of this incident will be felt and are being felt across Victoria Police. A police force and a close community torn apart by tragedy. And Cassie Zervos is in Mildura for us tonight. Cassie, the Chief Commissioner, is on his way. Well, Mike Shane Patton is expected here in the next few days to not only show support to his members, but also provide assistance in what has been described as a dark day for the force. Senior Constable Briar Joyce was just four hours into her shift when the tragedy unfolded. She's only been with Victoria Police for six years and relocated to Mildura just last year. Mike. Cassie Zervos, thank you. And Tegan Dolling has the latest from the Royal Melbourne Hospital. Tegan, the other police member, is improving by the hour. He is back, but as you can imagine, it's obviously very early stages at the moment. Leading Senior Constable Kinane was flown here to the Royal Melbourne Hospital in a critical condition last night. He has both internal and leg injuries, and we understand that his wife is here by his side as he undergoes treatment. The father of three is a very well-respected member of the Mildura Police Station. He's been part of the Highway Patrol for the last four years and a police officer for 21 years, so he is incredibly experienced. Wayne Gatt has said that the 45 year old will be recovering for quite some time whether he decides to return to the job that's a question for another day but we have just received a condition update he has gone from critical to serious so that's some sort of improvement in this tragic incident beck okay tegan dolling thank you melbourne is well and truly in the grip of formula one fever after a day three record crowd of 123,000 packed albert park today's turnout was 10,000 more than the previous mark set 20 years ago as aussie daniel ricardo put on a show in a spectacular qualifying session 
the charge of the Grand Prix Brigade. Turbocharged chaos. It was crazy yesterday and here today already insane. Go Ricardo! It's gonna be amazing. I'm really excited. <laughs> it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna get pretty crazy, but yeah, it's gonna be really, really amped up. Sprinting 400 metres to see drivers like Ferrari's Charles Leclerc. These Sydney brothers spent three days pleading for his autograph. Please! Please, did he sign it? It means a lot because I've been trying so hard to get it. Henley Warner flying high after just a glimpse of Daniel Ricciardo. Oh my gosh, it was just so surreal to see your heroes so close to you. It was a kiss on, so exciting. Because of COVID and the isolation rules, like so many other events and businesses, the Grand Prix struggled to find enough staff this weekend to deal with such a huge crowd. There were enormous queues for trams, queues for the gates, queues for underpasses, queues for food and drinks made worse by slow credit card connections. All very frustrating, but still... There's so many people here, it's just awesome. Bolton Ferrari! For local businesses, all welcome after a dry two years. Marvellous, it's great. Great buzz back. Good to see everyone up and about. On the track in qualifying, a spectacular clash between Latifi of Williams and Stroll of Aston Martin. Nicholas Latifi's had a massive accident in the Williams. Leaving both Canadians abusing each other. Latifi, man, what the f*** is he just doing? He just hit me, man. Fernando Alonso also came to grief as Leclerc claimed pole tomorrow in his Ferrari. Ricardo qualified seventh, giving the record crowd here hope. We love Daniel Ricardo. If he won, I would be so stoked. That would be amazing. Nick McCallum, Seven News. Melbourne Airport is coping much better than its Sydney counterpart on the first day of the school holiday crush. Passengers in Sydney battled through crowds at security and check-in counters, with officials warning the crush is expected to last until after Anzac Day. 80,000 people are expected to pass through Tullamarine each day next week. The airport is asking domestic travellers to arrive at least two hours before their flight. In developing news from Canberra, 7 News understands the Prime Minister will call the federal election tomorrow morning. Scott Morrison is asking Australians to re-elect him over his management of the pandemic economy and national security, while Anthony Albanese is promising a better future. It's the calm before the storm. The hallways of power are eerily quiet. The Prime Minister will call time on the 46th Parliament tomorrow. Things are tough. And they've been really tough. He posted this video on social been... media today. There's drought, there's floods, there's fire, there's pandemic, there is now war. As he faces a tough battle for re-election. 40,000 people are alive in Australia today because of the way we manage the pandemic. 700,000 people still have jobs. Opposition leader Anthony Albanese starts the race in front. Good luck on the campaign. Thank Graham. you very much. All the best. Nice to meet you. Good Thank luck. you. He was at a market in Sydney's inner west today, testing out his campaign lines. Australia deserves better. I'll deliver a better government. After redistributions, the government is on 76 seats, Labor 69 and 6 for the crossbench. The coalition can't afford to lose any. Labor needs seven to form government. Labor has only won government three times from opposition uh, since the Second World War. So it's a mountain that Labor has to climb. And it's not the only struggle. Politicians are often targets in public, but protesters like these are becoming more fierce. A police are warning MPs and candidates this federal election campaign that the security environment could worsen. As Anthony Albanese experienced today. Are you doing a research with that? Is anybody investigating that? Scott Morrison on Wednesday. I don't care. I'm sick of your bull****. And Craig Kelly yesterday. 
He was egged by a protester. Now he's pressing charges. We shouldn't have this type of violence in our political debate. It's expected to be a very messy and very personal campaign. But both leaders are ready. Tick tock, tick tock. The clock's ticking. The PM hoping his time isn't up. Jennifer Beshwati, 7 News. More than 50 civilians trying to flee the eastern Ukraine war zone have been killed in a ballistic missile strike on a busy train station. Ukraine's president says the attack was carried out by Russian monsters. And a warning, tonight's report contains some distressing images. The horrific aftermath of a missile attack on a crowded train station. 4,000 people, mostly women, children and the elderly, had been trying to flee the fighting to escape the mayhem. Dozens were killed instantly, including five children. Among the bodies, blood-stained dreams of a life in peace. Everything exploded, this witness said. It was all of a sudden. Many people are dead. One of the missiles appears to have been spray-painted in Russian before its launch. The words, for the children. Moscow blames Ukraine, saying it doesn't use this type of weapon. Analysts believe both countries do. This is another war crime committed by Russia, says President Zelensky. This is an evil with no limits. This is yet another horrific atrocity committed by Russia. Russia's crimes in Ukraine will not go unnoticed or unpunished. In Kyiv, personal support from the West, a visit from the EU Commission President. Well, I'm to see you again. It's been quite Maybe. I don't remember. He is a president with a lot on his plate. She is a president who was visibly shocked by the lineup of bodies in Bucha waiting to be buried. It is the unthinkable has happened here. We have seen the cruel face of. Um, Putin's army. Now the EU is offering to fast-track membership of the bloc for Ukraine. The missiles and artillery have been raining down for more than six weeks now. Here, a heritage-listed youth library was destroyed in Chernihiv. The city people are still trying to flee after being besieged by Russians for weeks. Power, water, gas all cut off. Uh, These people have lost their home, says this coffee shop owner. He's organised a daily bus to take them out. Svetlana and her 13-year-old son Bogdan are heading to Kyiv. No. Maybe we'll be safe there, she tells me. Among the locations hit in this city, the sports ground. People had been using this stadium as a safe haven. Those who'd lost their homes coming here to use the bathrooms, the showers, find a place to sleep. And then this happened. At least four missile strikes. 100 people were here at the time. They've already found seven bodies. They expect to find more beneath the wreckage. They haven't had a chance to begin searching yet. They still need to bury the dead already found. In Ukraine, Hewitt Feld, 7 News. Reporter Jeff Parry is in Kyiv. And Jeff, there's a new plan to protect civilians. Yes, Mike, the plan is to push ahead with the evacuations as quickly as possible. The fears are that the next Russian onslaught could start within a couple of days. They're organising a, a Dunkirk-style evacuation using private vehicles. They're calling for volunteers to come forward to drive some of those newly created uh, refugees to safety in the West. And the Kremlin has appointed a new general to, uh, to lead its war in Ukraine. He's had extensive experience in Syria, a sign that not everything is going their way, Mike. Jeff Parry and Keith, thank you. Princess Anne has delighted fans jetting into Sydney to open the Royal Easter Show on its 200th anniversary. It's part of her whirlwind three-day visit down under. A year to the day after her father's passing, Her Royal Highness Princess Anne making an early morning arrival into Sydney. The 71-year-old patron of the Royal Agricultural Society of the Commonwealth wasting little time. Her first public engagements today, inspecting the state's finest produce. Makes it a very royal Easter show, doesn't it? Oh, doesn't it ever? Bon tish. <laughs> yes. Just before midday, this was the closest the general public could get to royalty. She was very like pretty in her dress and like her hat, and she looks very royal. For the show that brings the country to the city, for our long-suffering farmers after mouse plagues, floods and fires, droughts and pandemics, this is a much needed visit. How do you feel? 
Oh, I'm overwhelmed. I'm overwhelmed, yes, totally. She was genuinely interested, which was really, really nice. The last time that Princess Anne was here was in 1988 for Australia's Bicentenary. This time, she's back at the show to celebrate its 200th birthday. Before that, the royal family toured together in 1970. Princess Anne visiting with the Queen, Prince Philip and Prince Charles. Then, the 88 Royal Easter Show. It's been a busy three days for Princess Anne, viewing exhibitions, awarding prizes and meeting the public at the Royal Easter Show. This time again, a lightning three-day tour. Tomorrow she'll meet Rural Fire Service volunteers and head to the Sea Heritage Foundation before a garden party reception at Government House. Then, on Monday, she'll meet some of our servicemen and women before heading to Papua New Guinea in the afternoon. It makes it what it is. It's a royal show and having Her Royal Highness here to do that really tops it off and gives it that the importance it deserves. Evan Batten, 7 News. Treasurer Tim Pallas has quashed speculation mask rules for workers could soon be scrapped. There's also reports the government is considering changing household contact isolation rules and vaccine passport requirements. When we get advice that tells us it's safe and appropriate to relieve and release those mask mandates, uh, then we will. At the moment, that advice remains as is. Victoria recorded just over 9,600 new cases today. Health experts believe the Omicron peak is still weeks away. Daisy Pearce and the Demons have gone down fighting in the AFLW Grand Final. They fell 13 points short against the Crows in front of a roaring home crowd in Adelaide. Underdogs entering a hostile arena, facing an enemy crowd and the ladder leaders on their home turf. It was always going to be a tough day for the Dees. I feel like we might be a little bit outnumbered. As almost 17,000 fans flocked through the gates at Adelaide Oval, there were two words on everyone's lips. Go Crows! Go Crows! Go Crows! Well, almost everyone's. Go Crows! <laughs> We've come up from Melbourne this morning, so we're so excited to be here. But just minutes in, Adelaide made it clear whose ground they were on. Yeah! While Dee's fans were certainly outnumbered in a sea of Crows colours, those that were here made sure to make up for it in voice. A halftime show from Aussie star Jessica Malboy had the crowd fired up. Can I get a moment? Yeah. Can I get a moment? Can I get a moment to myself? But come the final siren. <laughs> the Crows flew into the history books and a third Premiership win. <laughs> Melbourne's much loved captain Daisy Pearce remained coy about whether she'll be hanging up the boots. And we'll have to go away and get better again so that we can have another game like this next year. Until then... <laughs> Rosie Barnett, 7 News. It was a terrific grand final and Andrew McCormack is here for a look ahead to sport. Andrew, it was an unlikely thriller at the SCG today. It was, Beck. A great game. David Noble spun the magnets as the Kangaroos eyed off one of the upsets of the season. The Swans were left without an injured Buddy Franklin, only to hold on in the dying seconds. Isaac Heaney, remarkable, and the Swans have seen off the challenge from North. Also coming up, how Tiger Woods pushed through the pain to stay in Masters contention at Augusta. Sebastian Vettel's nightmare continues at Albert Park as fists fly over in the NASCAR. And guys, a triple premiership star has made a pretty bold injury comeback today. We'll have those pictures shortly. See you. See you soon. Thanks, Macca. The Reserve Bank is warning that looming interest rate rises could wipe 15% off the value of Melbourne homes. Details next on 7 News. Also, the incredible act of bravery after a passenger fainted in front of an oncoming train. The fallout from Hollywood as Will Smith is slapped with a 10-year Oscars ban. And later, a new threat to free-to-air TV that could change your viewing habits forever. A driver has been seriously injured in a collision at Caram Downs. A silver Orion smashed into the back of his grey Camry at an intersection just after five o'clock this morning. The 66-year-old is in hospital. The other driver is assisting police.
Property experts are playing down a warning that interest rate rises could wipe 15% off the value of Australian homes. But the uncertainty is already having, having an impact in Melbourne, with today's clearance rate down to 75% on a super Saturday. A record 2,000 homes going under the hammer in Melbourne this weekend. Kick us off at $900,000. Surely there's somebody here to buy it at $900,000 anywhere at all. In a rush to sell before the three to four predicted interest rate hikes from June. But one, two, eight, five, and we're afloat. Interest rate rising are on the vendors' minds. Um, so yes, they're trying to get in early. A lot of people are deciding right now is the time to sell and take advantage of the growth we've seen over the last few years. The Reserve Bank estimates a lift in interest rates of two percentage points could trigger a 15% fall in house prices. But Victoria's peak real estate body is calling for calm. There's no anecdotal evidence that the interest rates are going to have that big effect. I mean, a 15% market drop is pretty much unheard of. We'll probably see prices flatline. The RBA expects the vast majority of Victorian households will be able to manage rising loan repayments, but warns new borrowers could be more likely to struggle with mortgage stress. What will happen is that they may have to delay the sale of the property, sort of instead of in 10 years, they might have to go in 11 years as they play catch up. Jade Vincent, 7 News. Dramatic footage has emerged of the moment a man collapsed onto tracks just moments before a train arrived in Sydney. Two brave passengers jumped into the path of the oncoming train and pulled the man to safety. The 57-year-old suffered minor head and wrist injuries. Will Smith has been slapped with a 10-year ban from the Oscars for his on-stage attack on comedian Chris Rock. The Academy's board has also apologised for how it handled the night, revealing it was unprepared for the unprecedented. From Hollywood's highest honour to entertainment exile, Will Smith learning his fate over that unforgettable slap. Oh, wow! Will Smith just smacked the shit out of me. It'll be a decade before he graces another Oscars red carpet, the Academy banning him for the assault on Chris Rock, saying the 94th Academy Awards were overshadowed by the unacceptable and harmful behaviour we saw Mr Smith exhibit on stage. Less than an hour after the incident... Will Smith! Smith was accepting the award for Best Actor, the Academy conceding it could have handled the drama better but was unprepared for the unprecedented. In a preemptive strike, Smith quit the Academy last week. This ban means that he won't be able to attend ceremonies for the next 10 years, but he can keep his Oscar and likely be nominated for more. It could have been worse because he could have had a lifetime ban, but, you know, with him not being a member... You know, there wasn't much recourse or any other uh, options that the Academy could have taken. In a short statement, Smith said, I accept and respect the Academy's decision. In Los Angeles, Ashley Mullaney, 7 News. Well, the weather has turned it on for a big weekend of fun in the city and Sonia Marinelli is here to tell us all about it, Sonia. Mike, we were spoiled from the moment the sun rose. It was an absolutely stunning morning no matter where you were. Thick cloud joined us through the afternoon, but by then the warm breeze had already done its work. It took us from a mild 16 to a high of 25. And while it's not unusual at this time of year, both the day's minimum and maximum were a good five degrees above the April average. And you want to know the best bit? We're backing it up with an even warmer day tomorrow. Mike, I'll join you both after sport with the details. Great news for Formula One. Thanks, Son. Up next, heartbroken and homeless. The campaign to help desperate Brunswick West residents after fire gutted their apartments. Also, a push to make more Melbourne suburbs go green. Tennis legend Boris Becker staring at a stint behind bars. And free-to-air TV under fire, why your viewing habits could be forced to change. Three new parks will be created in Melbourne's outer suburbs. They'll be built in Werribee, Corroy Creek and Clyde. The $20 million plan includes walking tracks, car parks, barbecue facilities and wetlands. 700 hectares just amongst the three parks. Uh, that's more than 300 times the size of the MCG. Locals are being asked for feedback on the layout of the new green areas. The Brunswick community is rallying behind residents who've lost everything after a devastating factory fire. The blaze left more than a dozen homeless and in desperate need of help. 
Two days after a fire destroyed a Brunswick business, firefighters are still picking up the pieces. The smell of smoke lingers as emergency services demolished what was left of the smouldering warehouse. There's a risk of collapse. Uh, currently we have a uh, professional demolition company that have commenced their works. The blaze has left more than a dozen people in the apartment block next door, homeless. The damage throughout is extensive but in one particular apartment you walk in, the ceiling is black, the bedroom, everything is singed. You make your way upstairs and you can see the sky through the roof. It's honestly devastating. Neighbours were carrying out anything they could salvage. Residents were told they were allowed back into their apartments to grab the essentials but won't be able to return until the insurance company is allowed inside the building to assess the damage. It could take weeks to determine the cause of the fire as a devastated owner plans how to start over. I love to rebuild and come back you know, as soon as possible. I've been here nearly 22 years. Um, I love this area, I love this community. The community is trying to raise funds for those with nothing left. They've created homes here and they've pretty much lost everything. We just want to try and raise as much money as we can. Kathleen O'Connor, 7 News. Tennis great Boris Becker is facing a lengthy stint behind bars. The six-time Grand Slam champion has been convicted of hiding millions of dollars in assets to avoid paying off mounting debts. A star of the tennis court. Now a tennis star in court. Morning. Morning, sir. Good morning. From boom boom to bust, Boris Becker's pool of prize money dried up. A Crown Court heard he declared bankruptcy in 2017 over an unpaid loan worth $5 million. When trustees came for his assets, he gave them a bum steer. Becker transferred hundreds of thousands of dollars to his ex and estranged wives and splashed thousands on personal expenses, including a private jet and a luxury golf resort. He also failed to declare shares in a tech firm, a $1.2 million bank loan and a home in Germany. Becker's barrister argued he'd become too trusting and reliant on numerous advisers and had tried to repay his debts by selling several championship trophies, including two from the Australian Open, which remain missing. Ultimately, the jury found Becker guilty of four serious charges under the UK's Insolvency Act. Each of those charges carries a maximum penalty of seven years jail, which means the 54-year-old is now facing the prospect of spending the next 28 years behind bars. How do you feel, Boris? The man once called Britain's favourite German will now be sentenced in one of Britain's criminal courts at the end of the month. In London, Tom Hartley, 7 News. Two people are fighting for life and nine others were injured after a car ploughed into a crowd of people standing at a food truck in Texas. The vehicle had just been involved in a collision at a nearby intersection when it was shunted off the road and into the pedestrians. No charges have been laid. A big change is underway to ensure free-to-air television stays front and centre on screens around the country. As the battle heats up for top spot on smart TVs, there's now a push to make sure viewers get equal access to their favourite channels. Since the dawn of television, free-to-air networks have held pride of place in Australian living rooms. But that could soon change if TV manufacturers get their way. I think most people who've bought a TV recently would realise that it is harder to find your local TV services than it used to be in the past. The issue? Content providers who can pay for top spot on smart TV home screens. The result? free-to-air networks held to ransom. It's harder for local media companies to compete with those deals, so we need to make sure that we ensure that local media services get a look in. Experts say it's the viewers who will suffer. It's important that we have clear and easy access to the free-to-air channels because, let's face it, that's where we find our news, uh, our, news our sport, our, our live TV. That's, I think, really important. The issue of prominence of free-to-air channels is critical. Where they sit, up against major streaming services. The federal government opting for a broadcast working group over legislative change during a recent round of media reforms. Its aim, to establish equal viewing. Broadcasting policy in Australia has always attached a high priority 
to free-to-air television being as widely accessible to all Australians. Industry heavyweights met for the first time yesterday. The issue of free-to-air prominence on smart TVs a priority. Now it's hoped that content produced in places like this isn't totally lost in the digital age. Liam Tapper, 7 News. Up next, bikies are infiltrating Melbourne ports accused of helping cartels smuggle drugs into Australia. Also, the robo-rescue dog designed to go places too dangerous for humans. And putting the pieces together at Victoria's annual jigsaw competition. A crackdown is underway on Melbourne port and airport staff accused of working for drug smugglers. Border Force is investigating 77 Victorians involved in importing schemes across the state. At least 16 have links to bikie gangs and others have already resigned after coming under suspicion. Investigators believe criminals target active freight workers and then bring them into illegal schemes. The future of emergency rescues in Australia could soon rest with high-tech robo-dogs. Spot is a lean, mean machine designed to go places too dangerous for humans. He looks like a dog and he's got all the tricks. Spot the quadruped, unlike any robot we've seen in Australia before. It walks on four legs rather than running on wheels or tracks, which means it uh, can move around easily on uneven terrains. Grass and rocks, no match for Spot, who's garnered quite a crowd since arriving at QUT from Boston Dynamics, resembling a dog, all part of his appeal. If robots look too much like humans, we have what's called the uncanny valley effect, uh, where people tend to get unsettled because it's almost a human, but not quite. And he can go where humans can't. Snake infested scrub, volcanic terrain, even fires. They could go into places that might be uh, too hot for humans or slightly underwater or full of noxious gases. It's hoped robots like Spot will eventually be used in emergency situations like entering burning buildings to see whether people are trapped inside. And they'll one day take over the dirty, menial tasks we try to avoid. Just maybe not cleaning the bathroom. Yeah. I'm not sure he's got the thumbs for that one. <laughs> Just needs to learn one more trick. Samantha Heathwood, 7 News. A favourite pastime is enjoying a pandemic revival as 200 competitors went head-to-head -head at the Victorian Puzzle Championships. They had three hours to complete the puzzle custom-made for the event at Malvern Town Hall. Alana Jenkins used the activity to cope with COVID and now it's a hobby. I complete a thousand piece puzzle uh, within, within normally a day uh, and then 500 pieces here today. This is the first Victorian state competition. Um, I think the first one was meant to be in 2020 and we're finally getting around to it. The winner will go to the World Championship in Spain. Who would have thought? Do you have the patience for that? No. No, I thought so. <laughs> Andrew McCormack is back with sport. Uh, Macca, Buddy Franklin could be sidelined with a fresh injury. He could be, Beck. It's, uh, we'll have the latest on Buddy Franklin next, next as it's heartache for the Kangaroos in a thriller against the Swans. Plus, new heroes stand up for the Magpies as both Adam Simpson and Craig McRae let their frustrations out. Ferrari fires at Albert Park with Daniel Ricciardo up for the fight at his home Grand Prix and Tigers hanging in there just at the Masters but it isn't a walk in a park for the five-time champion. Welcome back. Sydney has confirmed Lance Franklin has suffered a broken finger as North Melbourne almost pulled off an almighty upset at the SCG. Roos captain Jack Zebel bagged five goals up forward only for the Swans to hold on by 11 points. When the Swans needed a star to deliver, Isaac Heaney answered. He might just finish it in some style. Heartache for North Melbourne. And the Swans have seen off the challenge from North in an epic contest. So harsh on David Noble. Jack Zebel was a surprise threat up forward, causing all sorts of headaches. If you saw this coming, you're a genius. Jack Zebel has three. Warner went for six to give the Swans a steadier. Gives it everything. Oh my word, he could kick it from 55. After the main break, the Roos kicked four on the trot to take a 14 point lead. What a goal for North Melbourne! It got worse for the Swans. Franklin was subbed out with a finger injury. Yeah, look away, bud. As Buddy went down to the rooms, his replacement did him proud. Zebel had his fifth on the stroke of three quarter time to give the Roos a seven point buffer. He then turned provider. No looker to Turner! 
Jack Siebel put him in the show. Five goals and now an outrageous assist. But Sydney stood tall in the pressure of the final term, kicking the last three. A gallant performance for the Roos after last week's shocker. Tim Hipsley, 7 News. Meanwhile, Marvel Stadium Collingwood is in the middle of an end-to-end -end dogfight against the depleted Eagles. After missing several chances early, the Pies fought back from a three-goal deficit to lead by seven points heading into the final term. After signing a $5 million deal during the week, Josh Kennedy let Darcy Moore know that it was his shout. Luke Edwards, the son of Crows Premiership great Tyson, put the Eagles 17 points up with his first AFL goal. But the Magpies have a few father sons of their own. Now Josh Dacos knew exactly where to twist, exactly where to turn. The father-son theme carried on as Patrick Nash got on the board in his new home out west. At 34, Josh Kennedy continues to amaze. He's been entertaining us like that. Goal 691 for the Eagles veteran was followed by number one for a recalled Magpies. And Wilson dropped it, picked it up, and he steps forward and kicks a goal. Adam Simpson less than impressed. The Pies back in front. That didn't improve the West Coast coach's mood either. Only for Liam Bryan to wrestle back the lead. And it was Craig McRae's turn to show some frustration. It's just worth watching the coaches alone here. <laughs> a free kick for a push into the point post gave Willie Rioli the chance to keep the Eagles in the fight before Braden Maynard gave the Pies some breathing space before three-quarter time. Carlton Ruckman Mark Pittenet has been ruled out of tomorrow's clash against Gold Coast with a back injury. Meanwhile, Kane Lambert made a steady return from a hip injury that threatened to derail his season. Under the watchful eye of Tigers coach Damien Hardwick, the midfielder played a half in the VFL, finishing with 14 touches. Daisy Pearce will take the next few days to ponder her future after Melbourne's loss in the AFLW Grand Final. In what was potentially her final game, the Demons captain ran out with twins Ruby and Ali. The Dees got within eight points in the final term but were eventually outclassed by the Crows. Not the result we wanted, so it hurts. Um, but yeah, no use for feeling sorry for yourself. Sort of just acknowledge what it was. They, they were a better side today. Aaron Phillips also has a decision to make with a big offer from expansion team Port Adelaide on the table for next season. To the F1s and Ferrari has pole position at the Australian Grand Prix for the first time since 2007. Red Bull's Max Verstappen sent the benchmark in qualifying before his new rival Charles Leclerc continued his impressive start to the season. Charles Leclerc's got it. 117 Aussie Dan Ricciardo qualified seventh and is up for the fight in front of his home crowd. I think we could maybe put up a fight with them and uh, we'll be right. We'll be right tomorrow. I'm quietly confident. Oh, go Aussie Dan. It was a disastrous day though for three-time winner Sebastian Vettel who crashed in practice. He'll start from 18th. NASCAR turned into fight night in Virginia as two junior drivers went toe-to-toe -to -toe in pit lane. For Sam Mayer and we've got a fight at Martinsville. They certainly did. It took several team officials to separate the pair. Tiger Woods has made the cut at the Masters for a 22nd straight year as his incredible run continues. He signed off for a 74 in his second round to beat nine shots off the leader, Scotty Scheffler. Cameron Smith leads the Aussie charge heading into the weekend. It's demanding enough without 50k wins. In these conditions, even the greatest are tormented. That's why Tiger's entitled to be smug tonight. He had squandered four shots through five holes. Oh, and a terrific golf shot. I could have easily kicked myself out of the tournament today, but I kept myself in it. Every putt was like gold. Boom! to back birdies for Tiger Woods. And it'll be tougher tomorrow. It's going to be you know, quicker, drier, faster, and uh, it'll be a, a great test. Stuart Sink won't be there at the weekend, but he leaves with a prize Augusta crystal bowl. Only a rare few have won. Oh, yes. Since the Masters started in 1934, there's only been 24 aces at the 16th. Cam Smith had trod a similar path to Tiger, bogeys littering his card until the 15th. Oh, this is nice from Smith. 
under suffocating pressure. Adam Scott needed this to make the cut. Wow, that is not an easy down at two. Five Aussies have weekend work. Minwoo Lee on debut, finished with a flourish, but he's 12 shots behind Scott Scheffler. The world number one, the hottest golfer on the planet. Only one player has blown a five-shot halfway lead in Masters history, and that was in 1936. Pat Welch, seven years. Damien Oliver has claimed a piece of racing history. The champion jockey took out his 127th Group 1 victory on board Nimue in the Queen of the Turf to break the all-time record set by George Moore. Didn't think about that, actually, but um, it's pretty good. As long as I'm feeling good and, and getting good rides, I'll keep going for a little bit longer yet. In the other Group 1, Randwick jockey Nash Rewilla veered to the grandstand side of the heavy track to cause a huge boil over on Think It Over in the Queen Elizabeth Stakes. And Melbourne Storm went on a scoring spree against the Raiders. It's Munster dummying, has Poppenhausen back on the inside. The pass is good. Munster carves open the Raiders. Poppenhausen has his seventh of the season. Storm's spine fired as Jerome Hughes scored a double. Melbourne winning 30-14 to to join the Panthers on top of the NRL table. And guys, no late changes tonight at the MCG. The Tigers and the Dogs straight after the news. Tough one for the Tigers. Thanks, Macca. Thank you. Sonia Marinelli returns and Son, how's the weather looking trackside tomorrow? Perfect, Mike. It's warm and breezy with a showery change not arriving until well after dark. Stay with me. I'll have the details next. Hello again. Melbourne was stunning to start with in the sparkling sunshine and even though cloud thickened after lunch, by that stage it was already warm and breezy, pushing the city to a high of 25.1 degrees. We've been hovering in the low 20s since early afternoon, sitting on 21 degrees in Geelong right now. The wind was calm to begin with, then gusting at 35 kilometres an hour through the city around midday. That gave the mercury a really good boost. We only had a sprinkling of showers pushing down over the border today but a lot of cloud covering the state and both minimums and maximums were generally above average. A high pressure system that's been pushing in all of that moisture is drifting further away from us and moving in behind it we've got a very weak cold front you can see it right there it'll arrive in the southwest on Sunday afternoon bringing with it patchy showers as it tracks across the state. It should reach Geelong then Melbourne around midnight before it slips out to the east and as it clears the state it'll scatter showers and a cold airstream across southern Victoria. So tomorrow is the last day to feel this warmth because on Monday we'll be waking up on the cold side of that change. The rain is clearing the New South Wales coast now so in Sydney tomorrow showers clearing to a sunny afternoon and we'll have showers developing in Hobart and in Perth but plenty of sunshine in Brisbane and Adelaide. To Victoria now partly cloudy and a warm Sunday in a moderate north to northwesterly patchy showers over central and eastern districts mainly in the afternoon cooling showers develop later in the southwest. Mostly sunny around Melbourne and Geelong tomorrow. Showers very unlikely, if anything, maybe just a sprinkling over the east out towards the Dandenongs. Another mild morning. We start in the mid-teens. Then it's forecast to rise as high as 28 degrees around the city. And that is exactly what we're heading for here in the city itself. A low of 17, high of 27. The change arriving well after dark. That means we're waking up to a cool showery day on Monday. Just 18 degrees to start the week. 18 again on Tuesday, cloudy but mostly dry. It gets better after that, but showers at this stage return as we head into the Easter weekend. But how good is tomorrow? Top of 27, definitely heating up trackside. Beck, Mike. Oh, that sounds great. Thanks, Son. And that Seven News will have updates later. Up next, we're heading to Seven's footy team at the MCG as the Mighty Tigers take on the Bulldogs. From the Seven News team, have a great night.